Okay, so what I want to do now is uh, we've looked at two different ways to uh, uh, examine lim or analyze limit behavior. We saw the geometric model where we can look at these pictures, look for gaps and holes and asymptotes and that kind of thing. Uh, we tried to solve problems using tables. That's an estimation procedure, though. At most, at best, that's an estimation procedure. But it is uh, it, it is a tool that we have, uh, and, and, and if all else fails, it's a, it's all we have left. Um, what we want to do now is uh, get to the algebraic methodology of analyzing limits, in particular limits where the uh, direct substitution breaks down. And uh, this is an example that we've seen already. Uh, the last uh, those. Uh, couple of limits that we examined using the, um, the tabular method all had what we call the indeterminate form uh, as a result of direct substitution. And so if I have two functions who both go to zero at the same time and if I can try and construct a rational expression using those uh, functions then what's going to happen is zero over zero is going to be the result of the direct substitution. Whenever both parts of that fraction, through direct substitution, go to zero, this is called the indeterminate form. Now, if the numerator is zero and the denominator is not, then that is equal to zero. Right? Any fraction whose numerator is zero, as long as the denominator is not zero, that fraction is equal to zero. If the numerator is not zero but the denominator is, that's a different case. That's the case we'll do next week when we look at the infinite limit. But if both parts go to zero at the same time, then you cannot draw any conclusion about the limit itself. The limit may exist, it might not exist. If it does exist, it could be equal to almost anything. It could be equal to a negative number, positive number, zero, large, small, no way to tell. And so uh, the main idea is that if you do direct substitution and you end up with the indeterminate form, now you know something more is going to have to be done. I'm going to have to look at this in a different way to try and determine uh, how to uh, sort out the details. And uh, it turns out there's no really one size fits all of this. Uh, we're going to have to look at the different forms and use different methodologies to produce the result that we need. So here's an example of just what I said. Uh, here's a rational expression, and it turns out that both parts of this fraction are going to zero at the same time. If I try and do direct substitution, I get zero over zero, right? Uh, if x is equal to two, then what do I get on top? I get two times two squared, that's eight, minus six, minus two, that's equal to zero. 2 minus 2 is 0, direct substitution, indeterminate form. So from this, I can't draw any conclusion about the limit. Maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. I've got to go further. And for rational expressions like this, the trick is factorization. Why are both parts of this fraction end up being 0 at the same time? Well, let's see. Um, how does that numerator factor? Is that right? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Good. Now, now I can see why. Because they both contain the common factor that was going to zero. So, now, uh, and now comes the tricky part. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to do the obvious thing. I'm going to cancel the common factor. And what does that tell me? What does that equal? Five. Now I can do the direct substitution. I couldn't before, the zero factors were interfering. But now I can. Right. This result, after the simplification, this is the result uh, by direct substitution. So there's an example. It was indeterminate to begin with. It turns out this limit is equal to 5. But there is one thing here that we really have to be very careful about. Um, 
let me ask you this. Is that true or false? False. That's a false statement. Right? Because Why is it false? Well, because if x is equal to 2, the left-hand side is not defined, but the right-hand side is equal to, equal to uh, 5. And so this is only true if uh, x does not equal 2. Now, as long as x is not equal to 2, those two things are the same. But without that condition that x is not equal to, this is not, these are two completely different statements. And yet, we said these two things were equal. The only difference is, in these two examples, I've applied the limit to those two expressions. What allows me to uh, make that identification in the limit process while I don't have to worry about it, uh, and while it's a much bigger concern when I'm looking at these expressions without the limit. One important thing to remember about the limit process is that the implicit idea is that we never actually reach the limit point. Whenever I'm talking about getting closer to 2, I never allow myself to actually reach it. And so when we talk about the limit of a value approaching a number, we assume that that number will never actually be obtained. And that's what allows me to equate these two expressions without the limit when I can't equate them without, uh, with the limit, if I can't do it without, unless I throw in that extra condition about x not being equal to 2. The limit process assumes that's true. It assumes that x won't be 2 because 2 is a limit point and we won't reach it. So we've got to keep those two ideas uh, separate and we've got to make sure, you know, if we're being really rigid and being really rigorous about what we're doing, we have to make sure we understand that algebraically these two expressions are not equivalent. But if I include them inside this limit process, now they do become equivalent. As limit, these two things are the same. Without the limit, I have to make sure I have that extra condition. But the limit itself assumes that condition and that's what allows us to make that equivalence. So, I might ask you about that later on at some point. Uh, and here's a picture. Right, here's a picture of this function. Uh, let me do this. No, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, here. Uh, here's a picture of this function. Uh, what does this function look like? Well, it looks like uh, this is the, you know, if we just look at the function with, uh, uh, as a whole, this looks like the line 2x plus 1. Except at one point, right here, where x is equal to 2, this function has a hole punched in it. Hmm. We saw that earlier when we were talking about limit behavior. Here's an example of a function with a hole punched in it that's been... Uh, created through this uh, 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 rational expression. Okay, so um, that idea of punching a hole in a function is not just some arbitrary idea. It actually comes into play when we look at functions of this form. Uh, this is a line. This is a relatively well-known function, but we forced ourselves. In fact, I can construct any graph now. I take any graph and I can punch a hole in it just by multiplying of the function by, uh, you know, if I want to punch a hole at 2, I just put x minus 2 in the numerator, x minus 2 in the denominator, I multiply that function by that, and I've got recreated the function, but I've punched a hole in it at 2. Okay, so here's one example of um, the uh, indeterminate form and a result obtained through factorization. Uh, let's see, see if we can do number 2. Uh, I'm going to let h approach 0 for this expression. What happens if I try and do a direct substitution here? Um, well, by direct substitution, I'm going to replace h with 0. 3 minus 0 is 3. 9 minus 9 is 0. So once again, by direct substitution, this is indeterminate. Okay, so, I don't know. Any suggestions about what we might do at this point? And of course, uh, you know, th these are algebraic methods now. 
what can we do here algebraically to modify this expression? In fact, there's one obvious thing we could do. What is it? Mm, not factor. How would we factor this? I don't know. I don't see the factorization here yet. You got a nine on the board and it's supposed to be. Oh, yeah, it's supposed to be a nine. It's supposed to be a zero. Is that Howard? Yeah, okay. Did I tell you all that? If, if I make a mistake and uh, you catch it before I do, I'll give you extra credit on the test because I hate to get home and realize I made a mistake and it's still there. Okay, Howard gets extra credit on the quiz because he caught that error. Okay, okay uh, so we need to modify this algebraically. How are we going to do it? Expand. Expand it, of course. I do have, you know, and again, that's the question we have to ask ourselves when we look at these things. Uh, uh, in a, as an indeterminate form, I've got to be able to rewrite this in some way so that I, could, that I might get some clue about how to proceed. In this case, in the previous case, it was factorization. In this case, it's the opposite. I want to expand this out. That's what I can do to make this look a little bit different, and maybe in the process of doing that, I'll get some clue about what needs to be done next. So 3 minus 8 squared, uh, what is that equal to? 9 minus 6h plus 8 squared, so there's a square of the binomial, and I still got the minus 9 here all over h. So there's the expansion. And again, you know, there really wasn't much else I could do. And now what happens? Those two 9's cancel each other. Okay, and now what? Now I've got a common fact. Now I can do the factoring. In the numerator, I've got two factors, uh, sorry, two terms that contain factor of h. So I factor an h out, minus 6 plus h, and now, once again, in the long run, it was that common factor between the two, uh, between the two parts of the fraction that were causing the indeterminate form. As long as h is not equal to zero, then I can equate the simplified form and in the limit process we're assuming that h cannot actually be equal to zero. So what is this equal? Negative six. Now I can do direct substitution. Now the zero can go here in place of h and I'm done. Now, we didn't start out with factorization, but in the long run, that factorization was the key. Okay, let's try this one. Once again, same thing. If I try and do a direct substitution, I've got zero in both parts of the fraction. If t becomes 3, then what do I have? I've got 1 third minus 1 third in the numerator. I've got 3 minus 3 in the denominator. Once again, that is indeterminate. I can't draw any conclusion at all about the value of this limit. I've got to look at this and see if I can um, manipulate algebraically this expression uh, in such a way that I can identify something Something new, I don't know. So what? So let's see. Uh, what can I do? Well, I look at this, and uh, this is something that we see in algebra: uh, compound fraction. It's a fraction in which one part of the uh, fraction itself contains more fractions. In this context, the obvious thing is to simplify. I want to put this, I want to make this a simple fraction. I want to rewrite this so that, um, in particular, those fractions in the numerator are canceled away. So how do I do that? How can I fix this so that that numerator can be, uh, at least the compound form of this fraction can be eliminated? What's the trick? I look at all the fractions that are involved. 
I'm going to look at all the fractions that are uh, involved in, in, and they're all in the numerator. What's the least common denominator of the fractions in the numerator? Least common denominator? 3t. Right? 3 and t have no factors in common. So the least common denominator is their product. To simplify compound fraction, I use the least common denominator as a multiplier. Both parts of the fraction, top and bottom. Okay, now what's going to happen? In the numerator, I'll, uh, using this multiplier, I'll be able to eliminate the two fractions. 3 times t multiplied by 1 over t gives me 3. 3t three times 1 third gives me t. And downstairs, I've got t minus 3 and 3t. Three so that's the trick for compound fractions. You simplify them by using the least common denominator as a multiplier on both parts. I'm multiplying both parts by the same thing, so I'm not changing the value of the fraction, but I am eliminating the um, um, compound form. Okay, now what do you see? Is there any way I can simplify this expression now? Is there? Oh. I could, but I'm so close right now. Right. These two things here, this numerator and this expression here, these are almost exactly what I want. The only difference is the numerator has been turned around. It's the same subtraction, but the numerator is in the reverse order. How can I fix that? If they were the same, I know what to do. I'd cancel. Yeah, I can factor out the negative. This numerator, I, if I want to reverse the order of subtraction, all I've got to do is factor out the negative. Right? Uh, t minus, 3 minus t is the negative of t minus 3. Right? Negative t plus 3. I just turn things around. Being so close, that's the observation that I needed. Now, these are exactly the same. They really only differ by that sign change. And so once I've canceled that away, now I've got negative 1 divided by 3t. So watch out for that. Uh, those factors, or at least that, uh, that uh, binomial there, uh, the only difference between them was the order of subtraction. If, you got, if that's the only issue, you can always fix that. All you've got to do is factor out the negative. That puts the two subtractions in the same order. Now I can cancel, but instead of having complete cancellation, I have that negative factor left over. So what does this equal? Negative one ninth. Once I get to this point, once I've canceled that common factor, now I can do this by direct substitution. And please notice that every one of these three examples, uh, we had an indeterminate form, but every one of them has had a different limit value. The value of the first one turned out to be 5, the second one negative 6, the next one negative 1 ninth. They all started out the same as far as their limit form, but every one of them had a different limit value. So you can't predict, just knowing that the form is indeterminate, you really can't predict what's going to happen. You really can't anticipate what that result might be. And we've seen three different methods on which to work, right? Factorization, expansion, simplifying the compound form, and here's one more. Radical forms. Here's another algebraic trick that we're going to need in order to solve problems that involve indeterminate forms. Once again, this is indeterminate. If I replace t with 0, uh, what do I end up with? Uh, square root of 2 minus square root of 2 on top, 0 on the bottom. Once again, direct substitution gives me indeterminate form. Okay, uh, but how do I go from there? Right. 
There's no factorization here that, that uh, will help me. Uh, neither, none of these terms have a common factor. There's nothing to expand. There's no compound fractions. So we're going to need a brand new trick to treat these expressions that involve radical forms. So, what's the trick? Does anybody know? You might know what the trick is here. Hmm? Yeah, there we go. Conjugate. Uh, what does conjugate mean? The conjugate of an expression is the same expression with the sign. It's, it's binomial. Conjugates come in binomial expressions. Conjugates are same expression with this change in sign. So what I have here is a difference of two radicals. What I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a conjugate by uh, adding the two radicals. Okay. And then I'm going to take this conjugate and I'm going to multiply both parts of the fraction. Very similar to what I did for the case of the, um, of the uh, compound fraction. I multiplied both parts by the common denominator. For radical forms, uh, and by the way, this only works for square roots. This doesn't work for other radical forms. So for square roots, the trick is to multiply by the conjugate. Take the same radical expressions, but change the sign. Okay, how does that help me? Well, this is the way it works out. In the numerator, what I've got is a difference of squares. This is the uh, uh, FOIL method that produces the difference of squares. I've got the same terms, the only difference is the change in sign. So what ends up happening is I get the difference of the two squares. So I get the square of this first radical minus the square of the second radical. Okay? And in the denominator, I get uh, that t that was already there, and I get this new factor that came from the conjugate. What's the square of the square root? Yeah, this is the cancellation, right? The square power cancels the square root. So 2 minus t for the first radical, the square root of 2 squared is 2. And now, magically, the only thing I have left in the numerator is the common factor with the denominator. Finally, those can't be canceled. And in, in the long run, in every one of these cases, the last step is that identification of a common factor that's going to zero in both parts. But the way that we arrive at that endpoint differs depending on what sort of expression we're dealing with. The radical form has its own set of rules, compound fraction, and so on. But now, I'm finally down to the point where everything is sorted itself out. Now, I can do a direct substitution. If I place t with zero, the denominator now is non-zero value. So under the substitution, what does this become? Uh, negative 1 over, so this becomes square root of 2, so I'm adding square root of 2 to itself. So, there. Um, shoot, let me think here. Um, I believe in the homework, I don't remember if they asked you to rationalize this or not. Uh, we better do that. Uh, this is an example of a fraction that has a radical in the denominator. We normally don't leave, uh, in, in some context, the uh, simplest form uh, excludes that possibility. Uh, if I do have a radical, it shouldn't be in the denominator, it should be in the numerator. So how do I rationalize this 
I use the radical as, a, uh, you know, once again, I'm going to multiply both parts of the fraction by the same number. So the square root of 2 multiplied by itself, that will cancel the radical away. And what I essentially have done is I've moved the radical from the numerator to the denominator. So, uh, oh, by the way, I don't need the limit here anymore. Once I've applied, once I've done the substitution, the limit drops away. And I'm going to be looking at that when we start uh, uh, in when we start taking our tests and quizzes. Um, I want you to be uh, rigorous here. Uh, make sure that you write this out in the proper way. Uh, if you're still in the middle of the limit process, I should still see that limit valuation or that limit operator in the expression. Once you've done the direct substitution, I don't, you don't need that limit in uh, prefix anymore. That's gone away. So make sure you can write this out in a coherent way so that. It, it, never say two things are equal if they're not. If on your paper you tell me two things are equal that aren't equal, yeah, you lost points. Okay, so, um, and by the way, right here, right, if I leave off the limit between these two steps, those two things aren't equal. They're only equal if I include that limit prefix. Uh, so now I finally got it. Um, this is equal to the negative of the square root of 2 over 4. Okay, so this class is algebra intensive and here's four examples of different types of algebraic manipulations that are required to push this limit process through in the context of the indeterminate form. Once again, in each one of these cases we've reached a point where there's a common factor uh, that can, we can cancel away. But depending on what sort of operators we're dealing with, uh, reaching that goal is done a very different way. So pay very careful attention to these examples because we're going to be using them again as uh, when we uh, start extending the idea of the limit to new concepts.